educational tools to be able to make that happen within their towns. And so in a, in a couple of minutes, you're going to, uh, we're going to go through a, an overview of these different opportunities for you to get involved locally to get results on sustainable issues. Um, but first, I wanted to introduce a woman who most of you in this room probably know already, someone who was um, involved in the inception of Sustainable Jersey and actually is the co-director of Sustainable Jersey, Donna Drews. And um, after, the, you know, Donna's going to give a brief overview of, of Sustainable Jersey and the partnership between the Citizens Campaign and Sustainable Jersey. Um, then, like I said, we'll go over an, an overview of uh, the opportunities for you to get involved. And then we've got a really wonderful panel of experts to help take your questions and uh, walk you through the process, hear what kind of issues you have, and, and help you through it. So without further ado, Donna. resources 
um, to, to teach you about the different opportunities that you have to move these sustainable initiatives as well as you know, get involved in the decision making process. Um, coaching from experts like we'll hear from later uh, this evening and also best practice models as you saw um, you know in this brochure this list uh, you know is full of best practice models when you go on the sustainable jersey website you know when you click on any one of these initiatives that you might be interested in you get a kit and it just walks you through the how-to on, on how to get these initiatives implemented in your in your uh, town so the first thing I wanted to uh, mention really quick is that every town has what we call sustainability or what I'm calling sustainability power centers. They're really the players, that the key people who need to be involved to make this effort uh, sustainable <laughs> and, and su successful. Um, the, the first being the mayor and the council. As you'll notice when you peruse through this list, and some of you may already be involved in initiating some of these, there's a lot of ordinances, resolutions, and policies that have to be adopted formally by the uh, governing body within your town. Um, the first step, as many of you might know, is to create a green team in your town, and the mayor and the council have to do just that. They have to adopt it by ordinance, they have to appoint the members formally, so you know, there's this process that you, you have to have the buy-in from the governing body. Um, the appointed boards and commissions, they're up here because there's a lot of, we're going to talk about them specifically a little bit more in a couple of minutes, but there's a lot of boards and commissions that exist in every town that deal specifically with sustainable issues, like the Green Team, the Environmental Commission, your Economic Development Board, a Redevelopment Authority, Planning Board, all these different entities, um, you know, work towards uh, issues and, and policies that have to do with sustainability and should be involved in this process. The school board as well, uh, you know, conservation programs, implementing in the schools just education on conservation and sustainability so that the children, you know, are able to um, get this moving in the future as they grow up and become members of the council and planning for themselves. Um, also, you know, the, the greening of buildings is important because a lot of those buildings can be school buildings. So it's important to get the school board on board as well. And I have local businesses and community members down there for an important reason that they're major players within the community that have to be brought into the fold as well. Um, you'll see as you, you go down the, uh, the list, there's, you know, a buy local campaign, which directly impacts business owners within the community because they're, um, you know, if, if you're promoting a campaign to buy local, that's going to strengthen the local economy and thereby, you know, helping those local businesses out. Um, the community members, there's a community asset mapping program or, or process where, uh, you know, the community can get involved to identify, you know, where are the resources that we have in this community that we should build on or that we should try to strengthen for these sustainable initiatives and a community visioning process. So I think one theme that runs through Sustainable Jersey and the Citizens Campaign is that no one of these entities can do it alone. There has to be a collaboration from all levels. Um, you know, the mayor and council, while they've got the final decisions for a lot of these um, efforts, they, they need the buy-in still from the community, from the planning board, from the school board, from all these different entities to really make this happen. In order to really build a sustainable community, you need all the different sectors represented, involved, and having buy-in. So that's an important first step to mention. Um, and then, what can you do as a citizen? Um, you know, that you don't have to be an elected official to get things done. That's sort of the, the tagline of the citizens' campaign, and it's important to reiterate this as we, um, you know, move through the process to let you know that. Um, as I mentioned before, the governing body, they're a key, a key element to getting this done, but um, you also have a lot of power as a citizen to get involved in the process and to be part of the decision making when it comes to your town deciding the, the what's and when's and how's to move these initiatives forward. And we're going to talk about those different roles in a little bit more depth. Um, and I do want to mention that on the Citizens Campaign website, citizenscampaign.com, 
we do have online classes uh, that deal with each of these roles in more depth. Tonight we're just going to give you know, a brief overview of each. So we're going to start with what we call a citizen legislator. Um, this is sort of a, a term that we coined. Uh, it, it's really somebody who has the know-how to effectively uh, create positive change within their community. So, um, you know, if you want to advance your sustainability agenda, this is an important role uh, for, for a citizen to partake in. And it's, you know, whether you have your own proposal that you want to develop or you want to take one of the best practices that are listed in the uh, Sustainable Jersey brochure, um, it's important to know a few guidelines to be effective in doing this, in lobbying the planning board or the, the governing body in your town. So where we want to start with the, the citizen legislator is to reference two laws, basically, that give us these opportunities to be citizen legislators effectively. And the first one is the Open Public Records Act, which a lot of you probably have heard about. Uh, back in 2001, this law was adopted so that we, the everyday people, now have access to all public records within our towns, at the county level, and also at the state level in New Jersey. So this is, you know, we have access to the master plan, our budget, we have access to minutes and agendas of all the, the council meetings and planning board meetings and school board meetings. We have uh, access to personnel information, certain personnel payroll information, um, you know, actions on ordinances that are being proposed or have been adopted. All this information is now public and, and available to us through a certain process that you'll learn about if you go to citizenscampaign.com and take the class. More specifically, we talk about that OPRA process. Um, and then the other one is the right, it gives us the right to speak which was the Open Public Meetings Act, or also known as the Sunshine Law. And in 2002, this was adopted. It gave us the right now to make proposals and speak at all public meetings of the governing body and the school board, and certain planning board meetings throughout the year. So now, as citizens, we have the ability to bring our proposals forward um, and, and propose solutions to the many you know, problems and issues that face our communities today. So we've taken each of those laws and sort of expanded them so that um, we can give you the how-tos on really effectively using these laws in practice within your town. So in relation to the Open Public Records Act, we've got the, what we call the responsible proposal. And as I mentioned before, every one of us has issues that we think are really important and that we want to see changed or uh, addressed within our community. And the challenge really is coming up with solutions to those issues, right? Um, and being able to constructively do so as well. Get the backing and the research and everything to support all the facts that support our solution that we come up with. Um, so the first thing we suggest is to do research. So if we're going to use an example to sort of run you through this, um, we'll take the problem of overdevelopment, traffic congestion, poor air quality. Um, and you want to research past actions from within the, the community. So the governing body, what have they done in the past to deal with these issues? Has the planning board developed any um, you know, policies through the master plan, through um, other environmental agencies within the community to address these issues? Is there an environmental commission that exists within your community? And if not, how do we you know, get one created or has there been a proposal to get one created? You'll notice Sustainable Jersey, that's one of the initiatives. They have a best practice model to get an environmental commission created in your town. Um, and find out where the legal authority is. In this instance, we're talking about um, you know, overdevelopment, uh, traffic problems. That would be the planning board and the, and the, gov the municipal government. You, know, you wouldn't go before the school board necessarily to talk about these issues. So you want to make sure whoever you're going to be proposing this uh, solution to has the authority to do something on it. And it's always good to identify a funding source if you possibly can, especially in these this, you know, economic uh, times that we have here where there's budget crises everywhere at the local level all the way up through the state level. 
funding is um, a hard thing to come by. So if you're able to identify you know, an independent grant or some state or federal funding to be able to um, uh, fund your solution or your proposal, then that's going to be more likely for the, the legal authority to listen and, and maybe implement your proposal. So again, there are lots of best practices contained on the Sustainable Jersey uh, website, and they all have kits to sort of walk you through the how-tos and getting these adopted. Um, and in this case, with this problem that we've defined, um, a solution might be getting your planning board and your uh, local governing body to adopt a sustainable land use pledge. You know, saying that the policies moving forward are going to be um, sort of looked through a sustainable lens and all of these, uh, you know, sustainability questions are going to be uh, addressed through practices and policies that are implemented in the town from here on out. So that's an example to sort of run you through what a responsible proposal might look like doing the research and identifying the funding. Another uh, tip that we suggest is to possibly do, a, you know, suggest a pilot or phasing in your proposal. So if you live in a city that has different wards, maybe you might suggest starting a pilot in one of the wards and you know, seeing over a couple of months how it works out, where do you have to tweak things, what went right, what went wrong, and then phasing it in through the rest of the wards or the rest of the town. Um, that might be a way to sort of ease some of the concerns about you know, a, a huge project that might have you know, big impl implications on the budget or, or the likes. Um, and it might dissuade some of the, the opposition. I also wanted to mention about the best practices. It's a really great way if you're able to find a best practice like Sustainable Jersey um, offers. This is a way to take the personal element out and show that this is something that's been successful in other places and it's hard to argue with, right? I mean, if you're saying that this has been done in other communities and they've been successful with this and we'd like to see it here and it fits right in in our community well, and how do you argue with that? So um, that's another reason why these uh, initiatives that we've got here tonight, and, and even if you're not talking about Sustainable Jersey best practices, if you, um, have a proposal and you know that another city or town has done it before, you can use that Oprah process to try to find the ordinance that created that policy in that town, get a copy of it and submit it to your city uh, government or your planning board as a best practice model. Okay, so, oh, the respectful presentation, don't want to miss that. So. Once you've defined your problem, you've done the research, and you've developed it into a, a great proposal, um, the next thing is to actually present it and bring it before that entity that's responsible for making it happen. Um, and the first thing that you should always do is to find out what are the rules for citizen input. So if um, you know, you're going before the city council, find out from the city clerk's office when's the public comment session beginning of the meeting, is it at the end of the meeting, how long do you have to talk, <clears throat> do you have to sign up beforehand, you don't want to miss the opportunity if you've really you know, planned your schedule and you've got a group of people to go and make a proposal and you've done all your research, um, you want to make sure that you're able to actually make that presentation. Uh, we always suggest to use a no blame approach, this is uh, sort of the key tenant to the citizens campaign and it's not just uh, a common sense suggestion, it really is a politically strategic one. Uh, when you're going before somebody and asking them for something, you don't want to start pointing fingers and using the blame game, it's going to put them on the defense. So you know that old saying, uh, you catch more flies with honey? It's really true when, you, when you're talking about using the no blame approach. Um, and, and it's important to find in your research, even if it's just a little nugget of something positive that you can use to open with. Um, when you're making your proposal, it's going to make them feel good and more receptive possibly to hearing what you have to say. So if we're talking about the sustainable land use pledge to open up with, you know, it, it's good to see that, um, you know, our town has been moving in the direction of sustainability with some practices and 
um, policies, but I do feel that there's more that we can do and then go into your presentation. That would sort of take the edge off a little bit, make them a little bit more receptive. And then, so important, get a commitment and follow up. Uh, I've seen so many people, I go to council meetings all over the state and I see so many people, you know, do their research and you can tell that they've spent so much time putting this all together and you know coming up with a really great proposal and they've made a really well thought out presentation and then at the end of it they walk away and they're thinking wait a minute what just happened you know I didn't what are they going to do with this and I didn't hear you know a commitment so it's important to ask when you're still at the microphone and get it on record you know for a response from the governing body or the planning board whoever it might be and ask them you know when are we when do I and the rest of the public expect to hear back on this proposal um, and try to you know get it on record and then you got to follow up you got to come back to the meetings and sometimes it's a, a long haul that's why it's good to build a team of other community members that can be on board with you so you can take turns following up at these council meetings so another citizen role we uh, had mentioned on that slide was the appointed member of a governing board. So it's important to mention that the success and failure of making your town sustainable can't rest on the mayor and council alone. That's where all of us need to come into play. We all need to be involved in the process. And the boards and commissions are a very accessible way to do that. They're not elected positions, they're appointed, so Usually there's an application process or you submit your resume, um, and oftentimes it can be as simple as that, depending upon where you live. Um, so every town, at the county level, at the state level, there are hundreds of these positions available to people. And we're talking about boards and commissions like the ones I mentioned before, the Green Team, the Environmental Commission, Economic Development Board, um, the Planning Board, the Zoning Board, um, school you know, construction board, all these kinds of entities that are available for everyday people, not elected officials necessarily, to sit on and have real influence on quality of life issues within your community. So there's a law called the Citizen Service Act that was adopted two years ago. And what it did was basically create a directory for every town, it's mandatory that they have a, a public directory that's updated and maintained with uh, all of the boards and commissions that exist in your town, uh, who the members are, where the vacancies are, what their terms are, and then also have an application process for you to be able to apply right there on the spot, either on the website or at the clerk's office. So, um, you know, if you're looking to see, to get on the green team or to see if one is already exists in your town, this would be a good place to start to get a copy of that directory from your city clerk or possibly on your town's website and just peruse through the list and see is there a green team, is there an environmental commission? If not, you can help to try to get one created. This is where those best practice models come into play. Oftentimes, if you can think of it, it already exists in another town. So if Sustainable Jersey doesn't have a best practice model for you, you can find a town that does have a board or commission that you're thinking your town might need, and again, request a copy of the ordinance that created that board or commission and propose that to your city council and suggest the reasons why you think that the community needs this and, and suggest that you'd like to be a member of this board as well and you'll get an appointment. So there are lots of benefits to serving on a uh, board or commission. We've just outlined a few of them here. Um, you know, an opportunity to develop your leadership skills. It really is a resume builder. And especially if you do someday want to become an elected official, this is a great way to sort of work your way up the ladder and network and, and meet people and, and gain experience, leadership experience. Um, and it really does give you official status a little bit more when you're coming before the city council, say, to make a proposal. Um, to be able to say when you're up at the microphone after your name and address that you are a member of the green team or a member of the planning board or environmental commission, it just gives you a little bit more weight. Um, and then the last two are important, the opportunity to help your town meet its challenges and be involved in uh, public policy making. 
if you think about the planning board in your town and the uh, the impact they have on you know sustaining a, a high quality of life for residents, it's pretty it's uh, it's pretty influential of, of a body to be involved in. Um, you know, really a lot of the sustainable practices that are contained in the Sustainable Jersey process are sort of housed in the planning board realm. So, it, you know, it really is a, an important body that you can be a part of. Um, if you think about the Environmental Commission as well, with their ability to um, identify grants to clean up contaminated sites, contaminated properties, and how in doing that it can help spur economic development. So it's all sort of connected together. Um, and then the last thing I want to say about the boards and commissions is, you know, you've decided which one, you know where to get the information, you've decided which one you want to go with. Now how do you increase your chances of getting appointed? You've applied and you've gone through the process, what do you do next? Here are some suggestions, um, you know, after you've prepared your resume or your application, um, talk to the key players who are involved in making the appointments, the mayor and the council, um, talk to the chair of that board or any of the members of that board that you're interested in. If you know uh, your political party committee person or the, the party chair, you might want to talk to them. They might have influence on the appointments. Um, and more importantly, I think, is to attend those board meetings. So find out from your clerk when that board or commission meets or the green team meets and sit in on them. Oftentimes, they're, they welcome people coming from the outside. Um, and if they see that you are not even a member, but you're coming to the meetings and you're really committed, then they're going to be thinking, hey, this is really somebody maybe we want to involve in the, on our uh, green team or on our planning board because uh, they really have uh, you know, a commitment here. They're, they're coming and they're not even a member. Um, and then there's something that has drawn you to want to serve on this board or commission. If you are you know, not being appointed and appointments are being made as the years go by, you might want to make a constructive proposal around an issue that is driving you to want to be on that board or commission. Uh, that could increase your chances. You know, if, if it sounds like you really know what you're talking about, and again, it shows that you're really committed to the uh, opportunities that this board you know, works on in the town, it, it definitely can help increase your chances uh, you know, to get appointed. And then the third role that we, that we want to talk about um, is a citizen journalist. And I think everybody here knows that there's been a decline in coverage, news coverage within our state. You know, papers are sort of holding up left and right, and um, we don't have a, a network TV news uh, channel here in, in the state. So there's a, a sort of a vacuum of news coming out and key environmental decisions are sometimes the, uh, the first things to not be covered. Um, so it, citizen journalists then can sort of fill that vacuum and write about these issues, um, about what's happening within their communities that deal with sustainable Jersey initiatives. So a lot of times, you know, the coverage is about negative things that are happening within a community, things that can sort of, you know, rile people up and uh, sell newspapers. But um, it's important, I think, to talk about the positive uh, actions that are happening, especially with regard if you're, you know, wanting to um, see sustainable Jersey initiatives pushed within your town to be able to cover those things that are happening. To um, you know, hold representatives accountable if they're saying that they're for these initiatives and they want to see this happen, to be able to, you know, put that in record and hold them accountable as you're, you know, reporting what's happening. So what types of topics could you cover with regard to um, Sustainable Jersey and making your community more sustainable? Um, government budgets and how the environmental uh, issues are sort of prioritized within the budget. Um, this is an election season, so to be able to cover candidates and where they fall within these you know, sustainable issues. Um, any new laws that are being 
adopted or proposed that have to do with key you know, development decisions or land use decisions or economic policies. Um, and then the last point is pretty important, I think, because as we mentioned before, community members, local businesses, these are um, key players in this process. And it would be really great if there were citizen journalists out there covering what they're doing within the community. Um, you know, to, to highlight some of the actions that these folks and these organizations are doing to help make the community more sustainable. Um, a lot of times, we mentioned before, you know, no one entity can do it alone. Um, a lot of times there's community organizations that are doing a lot of these initiatives listed in this brochure. Community gardens, the um, farmers markets, the buy local campaigns, all those kind of things. And um, to be able to highlight that and, and spotlight these initiatives, it can only help draw more people in if they see that they're getting recognition for this, their efforts. And then the principles of citizen journalism, again, if you take the more in-depth course, you'll get more uh, more in this. But uh, I'll just briefly highlight uh, what we consider the most uh, the principles of responsible journalism. Accuracy being the first, you know, you always want to have more than uh, one source, at least two sources, to be able to round out, you know, the facts. Um, thoroughness. Definitely want to get comments from all of the stakeholders and. and make a well-rounded article. Um, fairness and objectivity to be able to give all sides the appropriate you know, response time. And it's important to say as well that if there's somebody who's sort of a naysayer or an opposition to the uh, whatever you're reporting, to be able to ask them, okay, well, what's your, what's your response and what's your proposal? If you don't think that this proposal is a good one or this ordinance is a good one, what would you suggest doing instead? Um, that way it sort of it does two things. It, it helps to sort of round out your article, as I mentioned before, but it also can shut people down um, if they really have nothing constructive to offer um, and are just sort of standing in the way, that that's a good way to be able to um, shut them down, basically. And then independence. You don't want to cover things that you're connected to or yourself. Um, and you want to make sure that you're nonpartisan um, and not, you know, favoring one side or the other. So again, I just wanted to stress the no blame approach and how important it is to, um, you know, try to make sure that you are saying something positive about the body that you're going before and asking something from, and to not come at it from a, a defensive posture. Um, and so we're just going to end here by saying about, about the sustainability toolkit, I, I highlighted three of these roles. I mentioned before that if you go to the citizenscampaign.com, you can get much more in depth on each of these three roles so that you can really learn the process of um, how each of these roles help you get involved in the decision making process on sustainability. Um, you can take them online, and also we will be doing these classes you know, all throughout the state. So if you have an organization or a, um, a group that you want to invite us to to come do any of these classes, we will be available for you to do that. Um, expert coaching, we, if you, um, you know, or have been in the process and you're hitting walls, we can help you with a one-on-one -on -one coach. We also will be doing um, conference calls regularly on sustainable issues with our expert coaches, and also some meetups throughout the year we'll be doing, as well as conferences like this. This is the first of a series of three, and you're going to hear um, actually in a minute or so about uh, from, from a few of our uh, expert panelists who are basically acting as coaches for you tonight, who have been there and done that from the citizen perspective, the uh, you know, governing body perspective. We have some really, really great uh, panelists for you tonight. So I'm actually going to call them down now. And uh, Renee, would you look at their panelists? And I want to introduce um, Louise Wilson.
who uh, is going to be moderating the panel tonight. Um, Louise is, she served as um, mayor of Montgomery Township for six years, and she was really there for the inception of Montgomery becoming sustainable and moving towards um, the certification that they've had and uh, the successes. <laughs> um, so, Twee, if you want to come down, and Pam, Donna. And would everybody please welcome uh, Louise Wilson. She's going to take you through how this you know, panel is going to work and, um, and then turn it over to the panel.
incredible well of um, information, source of information, um, a master of the tale. Um, Pam Mount, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down the road, which means I have to skip around. Pam Mount is owner and operator, along with her husband, Gary, of Terhune Orchards. They purchased the farm, I really wanted to say they bought the farm, but they purchased the farm in 1975, fortunately they have not bought the farm, um, and built it into a prosperous fruit and vegetable operation. This 200 acre farm grows over 35 different crops, has a farm market open year round, with bakery and cider mill, and yes, that really is a, um, a commercial advertisement and endorsement because I'm there every weekend and it's really a, a fantastic place to get just about everything. Pam was selected to Lawrence Township Council in 1999 and this year is not running for re-election so this is she's finishing up her, her years on uh, town council. She has served some years as mayor but whether or not she held that title She's always been um, a hands-on elected official and a driving force behind making Lawrence Township a leader in 